Welcome to the Barry Trammell Show. George Schroeder is a college football aficionado and a Baptist minister with deep Oklahoma roots. I hired George a quarter century ago to be the Sooner football beat writer for the Daily Oklahoman, and he went on to a great career covering college football before accepting the call into the ministry. We'll talk Michigan-Washington national title game and why George has traded in the press box for the pulpit. But first, let's thank our sponsors for the Barry Trammell Show. Next Generation Roofing, Weedman Lawn Service, FireLakeJobs.com, Oklahoma Ford Dealers, Oklahoma's 988 Helpline, and Two Fellas Moving. Let's face it, most people aren't like me. They don't want to help you move. But we know two fellas that love moving. At Two Fellas Moving Company, they offer free, no strings quotes. They pretty much, with 20 years experience, done it all. Their services don't end at moving either. Need to do some remodeling, some spring cleaning. They've got you covered with dumpster rentals and junk haul services. Remember, quotes are free and there are no strings attached. If you're moving in Oklahoma, make sure to call the fellas. Visit twofellas.com for your free quote today. And let's welcome in George Schroeder. Well, George, welcome to the show. This is going to be fun. This brings back a lot of old times. We spent a lot of time on the road, in office, in staff meetings, at dinner, talking college football, talking life. Uh, we, uh, we've come a long way, and uh, you're doing great things in life. And I wanted to bring you in, talk some college football with one game left in the season, but also talk about what's going on with George Schroeder. So welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me. I, I, I love it. And you, when you said it brings back memories, I probably shouldn't bring this up. I remember being at the courtyard in Waco, Texas one time with our old friend James Hale doing yep. a show together with him from his room. Yeah, his hotel room. Uh, That's right. A radio his show. His hotel That's room. Right. And it felt a little bit like when Kramer had the old Merv Griffin uh, <laughs> show set stuck in his apartment. Yeah. If you remember the old Seinfeld episode. That's true. That's um, it. And so that's we've it. done radio and everything else together. Yeah, that's right. For a little history lesson, George is writing sports over in Little Rock. I met him uh, at Dallas Cowboy Games. And in yep. 1990. Old Texas Stadium. That's it. 1999, I was a sports editor and was commissioned to find a new uh, OU beat writer. And uh, we brought George in, and uh, he took the job and did a runaway success job, really transformed the beat. Uh, in the process, you became an Oklahoman, George. And here's how I know, because about eight years later, you left to become the columnist in Eugene, Oregon. And after that, you became the national college football writer for USA Today. And they, the USA Today people said, hey, live wherever you want to. You didn't go back to Little Rock. You came back to Oklahoma. And uh, that sort of branded you as an Oklahoman. So uh, tell us what, tell us your uh, your affinity and your and your roots with Oklahoma. Yeah, well, first, so we moved from Little Rock, like you said, and, and immediately fell in love with the state and the people, really more than anything else. Um, they're just um, friendly, unpretentious, uh, and I like to think that's how um, Shannon and I, my wife and I, are too. Um, I'll let other people be the judge of that, but just there was just a, a, a casual hospitality that that we found and and i just i love the state and so as i learned more about it it just felt like it grew and grew and grew on me and usually when somebody says that they mean i didn't like it at first but it grew on me i don't mean that i mean we liked it immediately but it just grew so you're right i spent um five years as the columnist at the eugene register guard and another year at usa today before we moved and we could move anywhere we wanted to and i always tell people kind of for a la laugh line that um, I was thinking about Dallas, meaning Grapevine, as close to DFW as you can get, like Terminal E or something, because I knew I was going to fly a lot and travel a lot with USA Today. And Shannon said, what about going back to Norman? And so here we are. We're in Norman. That's what I used to tell people, and people would laugh at that point. But the truth is, um, yeah, I had a connection out of Oklahoma City everywhere I went, pretty much. But um, we went back to Norman because we loved it. While we were that when we had been there before, so we spent seven years in Norman, six years in Eugene, and then seven more years in Norman, and it's the place that really we call home. Um, just, just love the place. I, I will tell you one other funny thing: when we moved back to Norman, we used the same realtor, and I won't name him, but people would know who he is probably uh, that we had used when we sold our home to move to Eugene, 
use the same realtor to buy a house in Norman, uh, you know, seven years later, six years later, whatever it was. And, and he actually asked, why are you moving back to Norman? I won't name <laughs> him because he sells Norman. You know what I mean? I don't want, he was stunned that you would do that if, if you didn't have a job that was sort of located in the Oklahoma city area. And we just said, cause we love it. And we did. And we went right back, same church, same friends, uh, gained new friends. Uh, and uh, it was just a great place for us to live and a great place for our children to grow up. Well, fantastic. We're going to get into this a bit later. You're, you're calling to the ministry. You're, you're now uh, on staff uh, at Storyline Baptist Church in, Arv- in Arveda, Colorado. Um, you actually do a podcast. You're in, still in the business. Uh, Gridiron in the Gospel, in which you mix, mix uh, uh, Christianity and College football, College. two of your yep. passions. Uh, there's a lot of us walking the earth that uh, mix those passions as well. Um, let's do the let's do uh, the college football first. Um, your your college football uh, heartstrings go back a long way. I mean, you you wrote the classic story about your dad uh, at the Sugar Bowl one year saving your hog hat. You know, growing up a big Arkansas fan and. Yeah, uh, you've written a couple of books about Arkansas football, uh, a Razorback historian. But what do you, why do you think you feel the call so much? The connection to college football. Uh, I think, and I really think, because you know, you we met in Texas Stadium. I was covering the Cowboys for the for the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, the Little Rock paper, and I enjoyed covering the NFL. It was fun, um, but there is some. The, I think the passion, and I know this will that there are fans of a couple of different fan bases who will disagree a couple of different NFL fan bases, but the passion and the sort of the affinity and affection that you feel for a college sports team, you know, enormous state you, whether it's OU, OSU, or in my case, growing up an Arkansas fan, you live and die by that. And you live and die by the football team. And then you love them even if they don't win. Um, and so I, I don't know. There's just something different about the fans' passion to me. And so then in the business, when I was in the journalism business covering, it just it was so much more fun because it felt like the passion of the fans, which meant the readers and the listeners and the viewers and whatever other format, was so much more intense probably. Um, and yet there was still sort of this dear old state you feel to it. And maybe that's naive, but I, I think it's still real. And that, I think that's what it is. I, I don't really know how to explain it. I never really thought about why do I love college football specifically, but college sports more than other sports. And I like them fine. I'm going to watch the Cowboys or now that we're in Denver, the Broncos or whatever else. But, man, there's something about a college sports experience, especially when you're there. But even when you're not, even when it's on TV, that just feels different. What you spent? Uh, what was it? Five or six years as the Sooner football beat writer for the Oklahoma. And what you, what you learn, or what, what do you remember most about about covering the Sooners that in depth for so long? So the first, you know, the first year I covered them uh, was two thousand, and uh, obviously they won the national title, went thirteen and zero, and I and I knew enough of what had happened transpired in the first, in the, in the few years before Bob Stoops arrived, obviously he'd gotten there in 99 and they went what seven and five, I guess. Um, uh, and, and, you know, so that was great. They got back to a bowl game. It'd been several years since then, but that first year, I think set the tone, the 2000 season that I covered, I think set the tone because, you know, Oklahoma fans for years and years and years expected to be in a national title chase, just like right now, they expect to be in the national title chase. Um, that 2000 year felt magical and different and it felt like new and refreshing and as though people were, there weren't, there was no sense of entitlement sort of feeling from the fan base that year. And so I think that set the tone for me. It was a like, Hey, we are back. We can do this thing is what I felt from everybody around me. All these fans that I've been dropped into the middle of. Um, so I remember that. And, and then after that, I think I learned along with everybody else, the same thing, the same lesson Bob Stoops has told people that Barry Switzer taught him, which is you think it's easy to win them after you've won one. And then it's really hard to win again. And obviously Bob got close and never did. And then Lincoln Riley got close and, and, and was unable to, and they haven't won since, since 2000. But I think I thought it was going to, they were going to break through and win one of those years. Um, the other thing I, I really realized was, um, you know, in Arkansas, you don't, when you grow up in Arkansas, there's one team, there's one school. 
And so it, when you get to, uh, when I got to Oklahoma city and started working for the Oklahoma and, um, yes, there, there is a giant Oklahoma fan base, but there is a fan base that is just as passionate with Oklahoma state. And it was really kind of fun to sort of find myself in a rivalry for a first time. And I'm not really, I'm not on either side of it, but, but you're in the middle of the rivalry. And if you're covering one of the teams, people assume you're in one of the, in the rivalry, right? You, they assume you're the reason that this team got more space in the paper that week. Um, they assume you're the reason the headline didn't go the way you wanted it. And uh, so it was interesting to be in the middle of the rivalry for the first time. And I really, that's what I, that's what, that's kind of what I took away really was, uh, I mean, the Bedlam rivalry is a special thing to me. Um, I, I love um, almost every minute of it, including when the fans get on somebody who's covering the other team, even if that person isn't, a, you know, isn't actually for the other team one way or the other. I love that because, it, again, it takes me back to what I said a minute ago. I think it's the intensity of the passion of the fans. Well, of course, you were here for some great Bedlam moments, the 01, 02 OSU upsets. That's right. The 03 Les Miles, Mike Stoops, uh, the, uh, you know, the 38, 35 classic in, in 04. Of course, then you left us, you went up to Oregon where they've got their own bedlam. They call it the civil war, but was it a similar experience? The Oregon state, Oregon rivalry? Well, yes and no. I listen, the Oregon fan base is, is really passionate. I've always told people that they remind me of, of, a a small sized, but almost SEC level fan base in terms of intentional in, intensity. I mean, uh, which is unusual on the West Coast. After covering the Pac-10 at the time and the Pac-12 while I was out there, um, Oregon State—they love their Beavers, but I don't think they expect as much. I think they're sort of surprised when they when they win, and I think nowadays they're surprised when they beat the Ducks a little bit. Uh, and so, I don't get that feel from OSU. OSU. I, you know, maybe I'm wrong here, but I think the OSU fans, um, they expect a whole lot more and, and right, rightly so, I think, especially because of what Mike Gundy's done. I think they expect a whole lot more out of the football program year in and year out. Um, but I will say this, the Civil War, there's something about a good in-state rivalry that is um, different than OU Texas. It's different than a, a cross state lines rivalry. Because, and I think it's because you're in the grocery store with the with the people you're in church with the guys on the other side of the you know, the, the people who are wearing crimson or orange or whatever else. And it, it just makes it different. Maybe your brother is a, an OSU fan and you're an OU fan. You know, so I, um, there's something different, more intense, um, more fun, I think, about about an in-state rivalry. Uh, I like the Civil War a lot, the o, o, uh, U of O and Oregon State rivalry. But, I, but I, you know, it's, I don't think it's as intense as Bedlam. You... Um... Let's. Uh, we're in Oregon. Let's move a little bit north. You uh, you covered the Huskies quite a bit. Washington, Oregon's a healthy rivalry itself. Yep. You dub and found itself in the national title game. You're outside of your podcast. You're sort of out of the college football reporting business. You're not out of the college football fan business. You, you know you've told me many times about your uh, about your son, who is uh, the biggest college football fan, maybe either one of us knows. Uh, <laughs> three hours straight on ESPN Game Day every Saturday morning. He, I mean, yeah. he just eat up with college football. Um, right. So you still follow the sport. Washington, Michigan strikes me as a really interesting national title game. It's off the it's off the beaten path of what we've had the last seven, eight, nine, ten years of college football. What do you What are your thoughts on Washington, Michigan? Well, first of all, I mean, what's interesting to me is that the semifinals matched teams in each semifinal that sort of wanted to do similar things, it seemed like. And now we get the contrasting styles uh, now that you get. And it would have been true had it been Alabama versus Texas, sort of contrasting styles, too. But it's definitely uh, it, it's definitely true with Washington and Michigan. Michigan kind of wants to um, asphyxiate you defensively and then also sort of play a grinding sort of um, – ball control type of offense and and they're really good at it um and then washington is making up for maybe a defense that isn't as good but uh, but it's, it's better i think than people give it credit for they don't they keep people out of the end zone fairly well fairly well not well but they but they're clearly based on that high high octane offense and michael Penix jr is tremendous 
And he's also buoyed by probably as good a fleet of wide receivers as there is in the game in, in college football this year. And I don't think they get the credit they deserve, quite frankly. Um, but Michael Penix Jr. is an amazing player. Uh, I don't know what that translates to the next level because, you know, he had some knee injuries and things like that, and I'm not a draft Nick. Um, but um, I look at him and I'm thinking to myself, I think that guy's going to be really good at the next level. What I think right now is I haven't seen a quarterback play at that level in the biggest game in a while. I, I, I guess you could say, oh, Joe Burrow did it fairly well. And that's that's true. Um, maybe that's the comparison four years ago. Uh, but, I mean, what he did, that was his best game against Texas at the in the highest stakes moment. And so I love this Washington team. I think they're um, – all year long, as I watched Washington and Oregon, I kind of wondered in my mind, is that the two best teams in the country? Is And I know that's sacrilege to talk about. I understand that, right? Because we're talking about the Pac-12, which hasn't had good football. But let me tell you, they had several really good football teams this year. And and you're not talking about the SEC, if you say what I just said. Um, and I think Georgia's fantastic, right? I think Alabama got better throughout the year. But I wonder to myself if Washington and Oregon might be the two best teams in the country this year. And if that's the case, or even if it's not the case, they, they beat, they're the ones that came out on top both times. And I heard this somewhere. It's not, it's not me uh, saying it, uh, so I, but I, I just don't know who to attribute it to. But winning is a skill. Somebody said winning is a skill. And so it's as much a part of what you do as, as, as throwing the dimes to the receivers at the right time in the right spot knowing how to win when you have to win. And I think if that's the case, I think Washington has that skill. Because I think they've won 10 games in a row by 10 points or fewer, which is, you know, unprecedented. And so I love Washington. So I've talked a lot about Washington. I could talk about Michigan all you want. Um, I don't really know who's going to win. But but I but I picked Washington on our podcast that, that dropped earlier this week. And and um, I'll stick with it. I, I just, I just love this team every every time I see them play. I, I'm, I'm taking the Huskies. They got the better quarterback. They've, uh, they've played the tougher schedule. Uh, they've got a great offensive line, which maybe can counter Michigan's strength, which is that defensive front. So, right. Um, I think it'd be cool for, for school. Washington is close to a blue blood, but they're not a, you know, a 50, 60, 80 year blue blood. I think it'd be cool to have a national champion like that. Let's move away from the gridiron, though, George, for sure. a little bit. A few years ago, uh, you uh, you got out of the sports writing business. You went to work for the uh, for the uh, Baptist Messenger in uh, Nashville, and mm. from there felt the call to ministry. You went to seminary. Uh, now on staff uh, at a couple of churches, of uh, Colorado is your is your assignment right now. Tell us about that journey. Uh, you've talked about that with me over the years that you felt like you might be, you know, well before that decision, you'd mentioned it, that that might be something you felt the calling for. Tell us how, how a guy goes from, you know, from the press box to the pulpit. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a bit of a sea change, I guess. Right. Um, I, so I guess the first thing we say is I've been a Christ follower for many years and I'm grateful that God saved me. Um, and at some point, Eight or 10 years ago, I really began feeling like God might possibly be calling me to do something else. And it started when um, my daughter, Elizabeth, our daughter, Elizabeth, I wanted to go on a mission trip and uh, with her with her school. She went to community Christian school in Norman CCS and uh, both of our older kids did. And and she said, hey, can I go on this mission trip to Guatemala? And and I, you know, Shannon and I said, sure, go ahead. So that was in August and they were going to go probably the next June, I guess. And so they started having every couple of two or three weeks, they'd have meetings. And every time she'd go to a meeting, I would be like, huh, I'd love to go to that meeting. I would think to myself. So probably about December, um, I just sort of was struck by the idea of wonder if I could go. And so I didn't, it wasn't because I wanted to be a sheepdog and protect my daughter. It was just like, I felt like maybe I should go. And so long story short, I said something to my wife, Shannon, about it and she, uh, she said, well, be sure to ask Elizabeth first. And Elizabeth was cool with it because I didn't want to be imposing. So I went. And that sort of became, it, it's an eye-opener when you go on a mission trip for the first time. I know you went a couple of years ago uh, down into Mexico and you've been other places. 
um, is an eye opener the first time. And then I began to see the needs, the spiritual needs around me in a way I hadn't seen them once I got back to the States. And just I started going on mission trips. I started helping lead missions teams and things like that. And the next thing you know, I felt like I was being called to learn more and be better equipped. And so I started going to seminary online while I was still at USA Today, and I wasn't really sure why. I talked with a couple of pastors about it and prayed about it, but I thought to myself in the back of my mind, is it possible that it's ministry? And so I was praying at that point, kind of a prayer that's two parts. Um, God, do you have something else for me? And I don't mean that I'm discontent. I have a job that people think is super cool and I love too, but I, I think maybe there's something else you want me to do. And then secondarily, if you do have something else for me, is it ministry? And I didn't know if the answer was yes to either, much less both. Um, but basically, that's that was the beginnings of that, Barry. And um, then it's sort of this a series of incremental steps. You you mentioned going to to work in Nashville, and so that was sort of quasi ministry in that you're you're still doing some form of journalism, but it's um, but it's you know for the Baptist uh, Convention, the Southern Baptist Convention, and. Um, and even so, as I got deeper and deeper into it, now I'm writing about pastors and churches and things like that. And I'm like, I really want to be there. And I could just sort of feel this welling up inside me. And I feel like it's one thing to write about it. It's another thing to be on the ground doing it. Um, and it's not to say that that wasn't an important role. I think it's important to tell the story, right? But it was just like, I think God's calling me to do it. And so I ended up at, 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 you know, on staff at that seminary for a couple of years, which allowed me to uh, accelerate my learning uh, and equipping. And, and so I'm grateful to Southwestern Seminary in Fort Worth for that. And just through the years, it became crystallized that it's, you know what, I think this is a calling into the pastorate, into the local church. And so it's, um, it's hard for me to imagine back in uh, you know, December 2019, January 2020, 40, four years ago now when I moved to Nashville that I, and I just left USA Today, that I would be uh, here now um, and serving on a pastoral staff in, in Colorado. But, um, man, it's exciting to see where God's taken me. And, and Shannon and I are grateful and uh, just, uh, you know, hope that we can uh, serve, serve the Lord and bring him glory. Well, you, you actually visited Norman in October. And uh, you, longtime friend of, of Central Florida coach Gus Malzahn, he was yeah. he was in Springdale, Arkansas. When you were in Arkansas, you got to know each other, really great friends. We saw you uh, Big Twelve Media Days. You were with Gus there yep. in Jerry World. So, uh, but you, uh, Gus, has you speak at the UCF Chapel service, and great story. I wrote about it for my newsletter, uh, but a lot of people may not have heard it. Tell us the story about. <laughs> About Reverend George Schroeder uh, on Owen Field uh, last October. Yeah, so Reverend George Schroeder is still hard for me to uh, like think about. It's like, what, what, what are you talking about? And sometimes somebody will say, Pastor George, and I'm like, who's he talking to, right? But I appreciate that. Um, and by the way, thank you for writing about it, um, and, and you did a great job. So, yeah, so Gus and I talked uh, at Media Days, actually, in Arlington, and he said, well, hey, when we come out to, to Norman, when, when UCF comes to Norman to play OU, um, if, if you can get to Norman, he, you know, he knew I was headed to Colorado at the time, um, you can do the Friday night chapel. And so it's a voluntary chapel, and I don't know that every team does it, but a lot of teams do it, and they sort of feature it on a Friday night between meetings after supper and before they get into their final meetings, before they – you know, tell them to go to their rooms and get ready for bed. So we were in the team hotel, uh, embassy suites there in Norman. And, and he, um, and, 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 um, uh, and I, and I gave the chapel, I gave the devotion and, and was grateful to have the opportunity to do it. And then the next day, my older son, George, who, who grew up in Norman is, is now at Baylor and I stood on the sidelines and, uh, we wore very neutral colors. I think I wore all blue, uh, you know, cause I didn't, uh, you know, I've got all sorts of friends and I know they're wearing crimson. Right. And so I didn't necessarily know that anybody would notice me there, but I didn't want them to see me wearing UCF gear. Right. So so I'm, I'm very neutral, uh, just hanging out on the sidelines. We're going to enjoy the game from from the bench area with UCF, which is not something that usually happens. Right. And so um, right before kickoff, the kicker who had the perfect name to be a kicker, first of all, but to kick it on Owen Field too, Colton Boomer. 
comes up to me. We had had no interaction. He might have said, hey, thank you for speaking or something like that. Several guys did after the thing Friday night, but we'd had no interaction. I don't know him. He comes up to me and he claps me on the shoulder and he goes, would you pray for me? And I get, I thought to myself, I guess that's what you do, right? If you're a chapel speaker for somebody, right? And I, I love to pray for people. So I was glad to do that. So I prayed for him and, and y'all, you know, I prayed, God, would you, you know, protect him from injury and would you help him perform well? Right. You want an athlete to perform well. And I don't think I said much more than that. Right. And I don't have his stats in front of me, Barry, but he had a good game. He went out and kicked yeah. a couple of field goals. Um, and if you guys remember the UCF game, you, you know that that's a game that almost, you know, UCF almost pulled off the upset. Right. And so he goes out there after they've, you know, they've they failed a two point conversion. Right. So they went for the um, onside kick if I remember correctly, but it was an onside yep. kick and he's the one kicking the onside kick. And I looked over at my son, George, and I said, you realize he's about to get this. And if they, if, if this onside kick goes well and they recover it, he's going to hit the field goal. And then tomorrow when I preach at my friend's church, Alameda Baptist in Norman, I'm going to feel like I need to apologize to all the people because I prayed, prayed UCF to a victory. So let me just say this. That's, that's not my theology, by the way, but it is. It it was kind of funny, um, and obviously OU recovered the onside kick and and escaped with the victory. And so, um, I guess that was the best possible scenario for me because Colton Boomer had a good game and stayed healthy, yeah. and yet all my friends were uh, happy and not unhappy with me. Well, it's a great story, George. And hey, listen, uh, I don't know if I've ever told you this. If not, I've been derelict. I'm telling you now, I'm very proud of you. You're one of the best hires I ever made. You made an incredible difference at the Oklahoma and really elevated the coverage of Oklahoma football. Uh, could not have been a better hire made. And even more proud of, of, uh, of the man you've become and the, uh, uh, your commitment to the Lord and the work you're doing uh, now for the church. Just uh, really appreciate it. You're, uh, you're an inspiration to a lot of people. Well, listen, I, I'm really grateful, and I don't know if I've ever told you this, and we don't have to turn this into, um, you know, uh, crazy sentimentality, but uh, I am so grateful uh, that you sat down and we sat down together to, to eat before a Cowboys game one time and that you asked the question, do you know anybody, not just to me, but to the table, do you know anybody who'd like to cover OU football? Uh, and I'm so grateful for how God moved us from Little Rock to Oklahoma uh, to to Norman, to the Oklahoman, not just because of what it did for my career, although it changed the course of my career, the trajectory of my career, but because like you talked about, you opened the podcast talking about it, it, it became home for us. We went from living in a little rock place I grew up in, place I love, to to finding a new home. And so I am forever grateful uh, to you for that and then for how well you mentored me through the years as well. So thank you. You bet, George. Hey, thanks for joining us, and hey, continued blessings uh, in in Colorado. Hey, bus are in the Big Twelve. You're still in the Big Twelve. <laughs> Norman, Fort Worth, Waco doesn't matter where that you can't you can't escape the Big I can't Twelve. Escape. We'll what I love that. is you, we, you're going to show up in Colorado and come see me sometime. That's what I love. That's exactly right. Hey, thanks to George Schroeder. Appreciate it. Hey, remember you now can access us via the Sellout Crowd app. Just go to the App Store and search Sell Out Crowd. And if this is your first time hearing or watching the show, be sure to subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. And if you like what you hear, please leave a review. You can read me every day at BarryTrammell.com, across social media, and on SellOutCrowd.com. Talk to you next week. <laughs>